Okay, uh, maybe uh, we should move to our discussion now. And uh, maybe uh, I'd like to hand it over to Joel and to Pedram. And maybe they want to give a very, very brief presentation uh, to set the stage for a general discussion on short term prospects for quantum computers. Piers, did you want to say anything before they get started? No, no, I just I think it's best to just uh, seed the discussion. Uh, what we would want here is a discussion amongst the community uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, an overarching presentation, two presentations. Uh, we want lots of discussion, question and answer. That's right. And in the spirit of what Pierce just said, I, I don't have any slides. So, uh, and I, as far as big questions, there are other platforms out there we could talk a bit. But, you know, I, I do think we, I'd love to hear it since both Pedram and I have already spoken for a while this morning. I, I would love to hear what other people would like to talk about personally. I mean, we can try to spur things along if there aren't comments from other people, but uh, I think I, I would like to be more in a listening mode. Pedram? Yeah, no, definitely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to. I... I want to listen to people and then then you and then me. <laughs> well, maybe I could start by just asking you what is your definition of a time crystal? Um, uh, a Joseon junction is a essentially non-dissipative system and I can put a finite voltage across it and it oscillates incessantly. Um, is that a time crystal? I, I think you dropped a many body. There the, four... the many body is in the condensate. In order no, to have condensate the superconductivity, is... I have to have many body behavior there, right? No, uh, no, no. Is is a single degree of freedom then? No. Is is a ch child in a swing? You consider it one degree of freedom. So there was indefinite oscillation, in isolation. You got that covered in a many bodies interacting system. Well, it's could, many could we view the electrons as having constructed the time crystal, I think is the point. I mean, the electrons are interacting with each other and, and made this composite object. Right. So it's... But isn't there one of the, well, I don't know if it's more conventional or not, I'm not an expert in this at all, but isn't one of the definition of the time crystal something that spontaneously, let's say, doubles the period? So the issue being is not having a oh, one oh, harmonic oh, oscillator. Oh, yeah. But having a spontaneous emergent oscillation at let's say twice half the frequency, twice the period. No, that is not important. That is coming from these um, um, spin models and the pairing of the eigenstates. You can imagine three eigenstates could form triplets or something. This is coming from those. Um, I think the wheels and spoke I was showing it were always coming in pairs. And that there was some confusion in the early literature that this period doubling is very key. And then someone said, oh, I see period doubling everywhere. I don't think there's anything important about it. And I very much try to avoid that language in, in my talk. Uh, um, um, period doubling is nothing novel. Uh, um, uh, but the, the four criteria I mentioned is really have to come together. Uh, period doubling could, could be tri tripling or anything, but also, even if you establish that, that's a very classical physics anyways. So this is the four criteria has to come together. And the claim of uh, time crystal people is that um, this is the only way we know to do it is many, many body quantum physics systems. I have one sort of general discussion point I was gonna throw out there if uh, that might be relevant for some of the questions that people out here are interested in, but are there other uh, comments or questions like Pierce's? Uh, so one thing that we didn't really talk about much Joel, was- Joel, Joel, I, I, I think I've got a fun question. Um, so what is the opinion of uh, Google Quantum Systems about Joel's question, whether you guys shouldn't co compute uh, dynamic linear response functions? Is there any anything in the planning? A question is for me. Yeah, that's for you because you're the. Yeah, question. no, no, I'm definitely very excited. I think Joel has very um, couple of very key points. Uh, 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 he said uh, we are better in dynamics than um, than ground states. Uh, ground state literature and computation is very rich. We don't have much chance of outperforming them. Um, that we are very good. And then uh, he was not very specific, but I uh, I. 
heard something about SQ of W before, and I'm very curious to hear more details of it. Uh, yes. Basically, linear response functions, right? Like this. Yeah, so uh, anything it's dynamic, basic, any, anyway, anything. Dynamical response function, that is sort of primary information. Yes, yes. So, on this metaphysics, I think you do it well. You're yeah, right. The quench, quench dynamics and um, that kind of questions we are really good at, so long yeah. as we have coherence. I mean, one thing that might be an interesting direction, okay, so normally the diagonalization limit where we can solve everything on a classical computer is let's say 30 spin half variables or something. Uh, but if the if it's lined up in one dimension, like a chain, we can do better thanks to DMRG for at least many quantities. So that would be a case where we could sort of check some things coming out of quantum hardware, even beyond the sort of standard diagonalization limit. And if there was a physics problem to go after, uh, infinite temperature dynamics is already enough actually like the heisenberg model at infinite temperature is where people first saw this kpz um, the uh, group in slovenia uh, and probably preparing infinite temperature initial condition is maybe not so hard you just want to randomly sample all initial conditions so i think dynamics of a heisenberg chain or you know xxe chain or whatever if that's feasible um, that might be a fun starting point and yeah in general one dimensional cases are ones where we can do a little bit better classical benchmarking sort of beyond the standard diagonalization limit. Um, and then for, for higher dimensions, one thing I, th I thought might be worth mentioning for uh, people here who aren't aware of it, uh, just because it didn't come up in our talks, but it's certainly talked about in kind of the quantum uh, emulation community, um, are these Rydberg atom simulators. So there's been a small almost convergence where the quantum processors, the things that we think of as being able to program, have obviously gotten a lot better. Uh, you know, Google, uh, maybe IBM and Rigetti and a few other places, but uh, you know, they're beyond the limit of what we can maybe easily diagonalize, certainly. Uh, but at the same time, the, the atomic emulators, which have always been big, they've gotten a little bit more controllable. So for example, uh, Misha Lukin's group has this 256 atom quantum emulator that, you know, it's not as controllable as the kind of thing, as Sycamore, let's say, uh, but for the problems it can solve, um, it, it can, you know, I think make some contribution to the physics we want to see. So right now, um, that tends to be things that are more like Ising symmetry spin models, if you want, uh, at least, you know, close to that. Um, but they're starting to be able to also try to build things like Z2 spin liquid um, in their system. So you know, one problem is a lot of the most interesting challenges uh, for the crowd of people on the call are kind of dependent on fermions and for neither one of these architectures are fermions like the first thing you would try. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, please, but that's my impression. Uh, but for example, you know, strange metal is mostly uh, maybe maybe this is uh, just hand wavy, but it seems like it's mostly dependent on fermions and things like that. Um, so that that may be a challenge, you know, whether we can address fermionic problems in the near future. But at least spin problems, it seems like there's both the programmable approach and then maybe even the emulator approach is starting to be a bit more relevant to what we want. Yes, uh, if you recall the plot that I showed, I had non-equilibrium dynamics, which I meant mainly a spin diffusion problems, right close to the supremacy experiment, and I can imagine that would be the extension. And the chemistry problem, all down to this fermionic issue, being uh, at least needing twice more qubits or better accuracy. So this is correct. On the Heisenberg thing, I can say that uh, X, X, uh, XY type of interaction uh, is really natural for us. And, but the Heisenberg, we have to do, think about how to do it with ZZ at the same time. So it can get a little uh, complicated. But um, going to 2D, yeah, I think infinite temperature, going to 2D, XY model uh, with disorder, with flux is rather very straightforward. And we just are limited by our coherence time. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, infinite temperature, you know, initial states, but I mean, might be very convenient theoretically, but do, don't they require a lot of resources to, you know, to create in an experiment? Well, you're just randomly sampling a bunch of initial states. So you just do it over and over again, I guess. If you have a way to randomly generate your initial state, that's infinite temperature. That's yeah, all I mean. it. Hey, I have another question to put on. Um, oh. So you said you don't, don't have Hamiltonians, right? And that's scary to me. I don't quite understand what it means. What, what are the limitations when you want to, uh, God knows, uh, uh, 
simulate, simulate a uh, spimmel or something. How well can you identify, have a map between what you're doing and a Hamiltonian? Uh, uh, well, um, let me see if I, maybe I share a screen and maybe I find something. Uh, I think you should not, uh, okay, let's see. Am I am I sharing a screen again? Yep. Okay, there is an experiment. I don't have it here. Uh, no, I I mean we have Hamiltonian. It's just post Hubbard Hamiltonian. Um, um, so this is a chain of qubits. Uh, I didn't get chance to introduce them. Uh, you you see uh, qubits and you see coupler. You see their capacitance and Josephson junction, which. Uh, brought up, uh, and this is the coupling element between them, um, and each of them is a nonlinear resonator that can host uh, uh, bosonic microwave photons excitations, and these these couplers allow hopping of these photonic excitation between them, and the line below come can come to drive them, and since they are not linear resonator, they are uh, Josephson um, nonlinear resonators. Uh, the level of spacing is not uniform, uh, therefore you get the Hubbard U. So if you put a couple of excitation into this system uh, photons, they are going to move around according to these dynamics, according to this Hamiltonian. And we have done works which we show our control over hopping and our control over local fields and the Hubbard U. Um, um, but since this is a error correcting lab, we are focusing on making gates by, by shaping these pulses and not let them do run constantly. Um, so wait, wait. Yeah, 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 right. So what you're telling me is uh, really what I thought the quantum com computer was, but in the time crystal business, you basically use this in this different mode, right? It, that is, yeah, right. So you can see this, uh, the, J, the J hopping term turns on and off yeah. and and then and then you can accumulate c phase the, the entangling gate was based on this repulsion from the u and using this u to get accumulate a correct phase by idiomatically passing close to it or something so we are using it very differently but if you tell me that hey put you know do go to a uh, half filling of this uh, get nine qubits, put four photons, the photons would move around according to this. And we have some papers that are, we show that we have good control over this too. But you know, when you're coming to realizing uh, Tory code Hamiltonian has nothing to do with this Hamiltonian. So you have to totally synthesize it. Yeah, okay, right. I think it's better the other way around, right? Um, you can use the quantum computer in the mode when you do time crystal, right? That, 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 you can't quite realize also in nature, right? It's, it's you don't have that kind of control uh, dealing, you know, with conventional. Yes, right. So the that's time crystal that's disorientating. Yes, me, time crystal yeah, yeah, really, yeah. time crystal really comes as as a as a borderline. Uh, that uh, 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 did we realize it or did we simulate it? And I can tell you there were lots of fights over it. Best of luck, I would say. Yeah. And the softening the language and whatnot. Yeah. But to me is 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 realizing it because forget about the issue. The, the biggest challenge is this closeness and openness issue. Forget about that. If 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 you say there was not an issue, how would you make a time crystal? you get a bunch of quantum oscillator and you couple them. And that's what we did. So I don't know why should not we say realize, but anyway. And how about, so yeah, does that, it, it, what are the big differences then as far as this realization versus, you know, there were some, I guess, ion or atom ones, and then there's also like a Delft version. I, I haven't followed very closely, but are there, uh, are, are these all kind of the same, you know, dynamical limit or is there some, uh, different kinds of time crystal. I don't know the text. I don't no, know no, the, the crystallography um, of time crystals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you, uh, uh, no, they're all meant to go same direction. Uh, and as you know, it's all about many body localization. You got to prove your many body localized. The rest are just commentary. There's, there, there's nothing after that. 
And I think I would say that we were the first who really spelled out the definition and we decompose it and we really pushed for provide strong evidence for many body localization and showing that you move away from many body localized region or phase, uh, you don't have it. Otherwise, period doubling, that's what I really didn't glorify, period doubling or phase locking. These things, you, each of them individually, of course, appears on fireflies, as I said, right? The, the Delft experiment had only nine qubits. Also, Finite size of scaling we introduced for the first time, the Edward Anderson I showed. Uh, I was very happy about that. Uh, and uh, many body localization, we are showing that is really there and the really thinking about decoupling it from environment or how do you extract that signal from the noisy signal, that kind of thing. It's just yeah. coming together. Yeah. And one thing that might be out there is like a, a test case. So yeah, it is possible in other experiments to confuse MBL with like glassy physics. You know, glassy physics would be very slow, but not truly uh, yeah. anybody look less, let's say. And, there's now a bit more theoretical understanding, I guess, of when does true MBL exist? Like, for example, it seems you don't want something like a Heisenberg model. You want something that breaks SU2 symmetry and you want to be in 1D um, and some other things like that. I'm, I'm sort of curious. It, it, yeah, I think this would depend on an astronomically longer gate depth than what we currently have. But at some point, it would be nice if we could test all these theories about when many body localization is real versus when it kind of crosses over to just slow glassy like physics. Yes, uh, right. This is very big deal. And unless you could suggest something that we could see in short time. Yeah. yeah. But don't don't count on us to settle this dispute. Yeah. Well, it's, there's still some controversy over whether MBL exists in, in one dimension, isn't there? I mean, if you read, you know, Kofnikov's papers. So. Yes, that's true. So since we we mentioned time crystals and MBL, so um, Daniel, may I ask for your comment? Um, at least in the review article in, in the Journal Club, um, you know, you closely define time crystal in the context of this discrete time crystal and period doubling, right? If you wish half frequency generation, and yet we heard from Padram that he um, deliberately wants to avoid that language. So could we agree on what time crystal is within the people on this call, if possible? Well, I, I mean, I, I think um, the, uh, uh, you know, a very crucial uh, contribution was th this work by Elsa Bauer and, and, and Nyack, which showed that, uh, look, my, my colleague, John McGreevy, <laughs> who uh, is, 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 is wonderfully uh, cynical, um, you know, when I told him I was writing this journal club thing, said, uh, you know, why are why are time crystals discrete time crystals you know even interesting he said here's here's a classical discrete time crystal uh, uh i take a nickel uh i flip it over uh i flip it again <laughs> you know you'll go back to step 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 one you know he said uh you know the 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 uh the state of the nickel uh <laughs> it's it's you know um Flips every every two times, even though I'm doing the same operation every time step. You know, so is that is that a, is that a discrete time crystal? And, and um, the the um, uh, I guess that you know the the um, there's this important feature that that um, there's this range of stability over which you know, even if you're even if you're not you know uh, you know uh, you know, essentially having a, you know, a, a, a the same period for your for your your clock for your operation, uh, which has to do with the absence of a of a, a z two spin flip symmetry in the in this uh, unitary that you're still in this discrete time crystal phase. Um, so that was something that wasn't in the original uh, paper by. Uh, Kimani at all in, in 2016, but 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 then it was pointed by by Elsa Bauer and, and Nyack. So I think that's that's an important element of all of all this. But whether you know whether there are more generalized definitions of of of, of time crystals, uh, I'm you know 
that 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 may well be. I have uh, a non time crystal question, maybe for uh, Pedro. Uh, did, did you have no, more? Can I uh, can I oh, say? Sure. Uh, okay. I, I think I, I I can maybe share one. To, I I put some thinking in uh, my slide on on here, and this is really all I have to say. We can look at it one more time. Uh, uh, I think this is uh, every example that we heard, right? Josephson Junction and uh, the nickel or dime, I hear a very version of it, is all <laughs> falling on the left. There are few degrees of freedom and the many body or many interacting degrees of freedom is part of the definition. So indefinite oscillation, isolation is all good, uh, but many body, lots of degrees of freedom is also in the key. And I don't think coming back after two cycles is the key. You got to come back after finite cycles and repeat itself, uh, but it cannot be few degrees of freedom. Simply because the system is too few degrees of freedom would naturally have a cycle. Is that what you're saying? It's just not what we are interested in because we can find so many classical examples. Is 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 nothing. Mm -hmm. I think you if you want it to be a you know a phase of matter then you know. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's another way of saying it. Mm -hmm. and, could, and could you repeat how MBL plays into this? In other words, why is MBL essential to realize a time crystal? Is the stability of it. So there is nothing rules out uh, uh, classical physics. You can find some classical cases as Norman Yao is trying hard to find it. So there's nothing forbids you. We, we just couldn't find it. The only example that we happen to know is quantum and the quantum stability, this indefiniteness comes from the argument that if you believe MBL is a stable, then you got <laughs> So it's just borrowing the concept of a stability to bring here to secure indefinite oscillation. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and there is this work by Watanabe in Oshikawa, you know, uh, a while back, which, you know, Put some limits on on whether you could have uh, anything like uh, you know, spontaneous breaking of of uh, of time reversal and 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 the MBL phases, which are are not thermal phases. Um, I think thus far have been you know the only possibilities where this this is shown to be possible. You know. I see. So they evade the the Watanabe or Shikawa in a way that they're not thermal averaging. Right. Right, because the the M MBL is 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 non is non thermal. It doesn't you know doesn't it's not a you know phase where ETH holds. So, and I think that's I think that's crucial. I don't know if Pedro would agree, but yes, yeah. Well, that's the only example we know. What what uh, uh, Oshikawa and Watanabe showed that uh, in equilibrium you cannot achieve it. And then we are coming to these non-equilibrium systems. The only way we can know we can have a non-equilibrium steady behavior is MBL. You can find in classical system, not a forbids you. We just normally, a, it. normally a flow case system. You, I mean, w w should heat up to to infinite temperature. Yeah, yeah that's And and the only way out of that uh, that we know thus far, at least so far as I understand, is is if 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 there's a MBL. Jewel has been waiting. Well, I, well, I was wondering, I, I had a question maybe uh, about between your talk and uh, Steve's talk yesterday on, okay, it seems like an advantage of the your system is you can measure some operators that would be a little bit broader than the class we can usually measure in like either, at least in solids, maybe even atomic experiments, which like you could measure multi-spin operators. Uh, we can, we can uh, yes, we can even measure non-Hermitian operator by just adding these local observables. We have done uh, 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 poly, uh, you had this thing, you had a very long- Exactly, so you can measure like poly strings and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we did so, that, we did yeah, that. Exactly, no, that, I mean, those would be like the, you know, the operators that would tell you which Z2 sector you're in, they're kind of non-local strings of poly. Yes, so, uh, we, we, yes, we can do yeah. that. So what I thought that might be, one thing that I thought that might be useful for, so we heard yesterday, uh, there's this work from Steve Nagler and Alan Tennant and collaborators that you know, even from the neutron scattering observable, you can infer some things about entanglement. Uh, 
but it seems like you could probably infer even more if you had sort of three spin or four spin. Like we don't usually think much in condensed matter about three point, four point operators. I guess we, we tend to think either about two point operators or uh, sort of strings where you're looping around a chain or you're doing a Jordan Wigner transformation or something. So I'm sort of curious, you know, have, have you, has there been much thought on uh, you, you know things you could measure that we could not measure in a normal linear response two point experiment and, and whether those could tell us something? Uh, um, yeah, I can even, um, if you give me a minute, maybe I can even pull out something. If I talk about something else, I can uh, pull out a different presentation, which I can show you we have measured um, non-local, let me see where was it? Uh, uh, maybe here, maybe it's not taking that long. This is a uh, work of ours, which was not greeted kindly by referees. Um, maybe, okay, so now I can share. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, I'm not a Zoom person, so how does it work? Okay, let's see. Uh, this could be interesting to you. Um, do you, do you see it? Yes. Um, so this is a chain that uh, I think probably we are in a, well, you can see three different distinct geometries. Um, and we are looking at the dynamics, quench dynamics is topic of the day, um, uh, of operators uh, of, sorry, uh, we are asking how A and B getting entangled with each other. Uh, a and B1, A and B2, and A and B3. And you can see to, to do that, of course, we need to measure uh, all the Pauli operators to get the full density matrix of this subsystem. And you can see when A is close to B, quickly they get entangled, but then to monogamy of entanglement, uh, they, they are less entangled with each other. And then we can change the geometry and explore the physics, and we can go further and further. And you see this is uh, three by five, array of qubits, you can see how A and B3 are entangled. So meaning that we have done the full tomography of A and B3. And then this can be, ex the entanglement of formation is something actually very crucial because uh, it's a affirmative signal. It means that you're not coupled to your environment and you're only coupled to each other. So you can see the entanglement forming and whatnot, but, uh, but we can do it for bigger subsystems if it's needed. What I'm trying to say is, um, is that yes, doing entanglement of subsystem by, by default means that you have measured Pauli operators. So what, what what like time evolution is what, what is your time? Um, you yeah, so right, I can, general, right? right, I can tell you that maybe about 10 or between 10 and 100, a hopping rate. So it is a Ham Hamiltonian evolution? That was a Hamiltonian evolution. That was an example of so the you Hamiltonian. You can't do Hamiltonian evolution. That, that example was a Hamiltonian evolution, and uh, and um, yeah, and and um, uh, let's say about between ten and hundred hopping rates, we could do the dynamics. Yeah. So just to understand what you were saying. So okay, I, I had been thinking you would like measure. Uh, Polys, but it seems like is that the measurement you do? But then from that you can do tomography and get out the reduced density well, matrix of two spins or something. Yes, or? yes, yes, yes. The tomography, tomography of let's say five qubits means measure all the possible Pauli configuration within that five qubits. Yeah, but uh, so you, you can get the not just like the entangled the, the bipartite entanglement the von Neumann entropy I guess of the reduced density matrix. You could get like the the full. You know, 32 by 32. Matrix. Yeah, oh, that's neat. Yeah, so the full density matrix is there. Um, right, but maybe I confused the method by Peter Zoller is just to approximate Rene entropy, um, but otherwise up to five qubits, definitely we can measure. Well, if you want tomography up to five qubits, but if you just want a large uh, chain of Pauli operators, of course we can just do that, yeah. Uh, can we have some discussion uh, on uh, other, uh, sorry, P.S. was going to say something. I was just going to say other possible platforms where quantum materials and condensed matter may play a role. I guess, Joel, you talked about the other way around, quantum computers possibly solving our problems. 
but uh, how does the quantum materials community uh, yeah yeah i mean i could say a little bit uh, just from observing it closely over the years okay so one interesting uh area is, is to try to use you know let's say quantum materials beyond aluminum and niobium you know beyond conventional superconductors uh to build quantum processors and so one direction is the topological direction and there it looked like there was a it looked like the the system that was in the lead for topological qubits was the superconductor semiconductor junctions in a field um but that is no longer so clear uh you, i don't know if people have followed all this closely but um it seems like the, you know the pathway to a topological qubit may require working with less off the shelf materials like indium arsenide and more things like topological insulators or even better topological superconductors so as an example of an enabling you know i, I think we we heard some thing about this earlier uh the existence of Majorana fermions in topological superconductors may be a very promising start in that direction. I mean, there, there's still a lot of work left to do. It's not, it's not at the stage of Sycamore, let's say. Um, but I, I do think that the use of topological materials is one direction. Um, I know less about other kinds of quantum materials um, that you could use for sensing or computation. So I, I kind of hand that over to someone else. But at least with topological materials, it seems like on the one hand, we have more different materials that might be useful um, and on the other hand, doing it with uh, straightforward semiconductors and superconductors seems to be harder than we thought. I mean, you know, there, there, are, there may be, okay, I guess the challenge is to find both a topological state that has the right uh, excitations. Um, you know, there is progress, for example, in seeing abelian fractional statistics by Mike Manfred Purdue, but you know, for the quantum computer, you need a non-abelian state. Um, that was in just, you know, fractional quantum Hall effect states. Um, so we, we need a state that has the right excitations, but also where we have the hope of being able to manipulate them. Um, so spin liquids, you know, the, the possibility of topological spin liquids has been talked about a lot here. Uh, manipulating those is, on the face of it, at least, it seems hard. Uh, but the, the, that's a direction, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I think there are reasons why Microsoft and, and places like that sort of focused on using electrons rather than spins. Um, so I think it depends, you know, you might hope at least to be able to see non-abelian statistics, but to actually get to scalability or something, uh, you'd probably want electrons. But you know, the, the, the other uses of quantum materials in this field, I, I think uh, someone else would be better placed to comment on. Pierce and Silke have their hands up. Um, mine was connected with the previous discussion, but let me just ask. I was I was curious to know how programmable Sycamore is. Is it? Uh, can you just input, uh, uh, run a code, and reset it to to run unitary evolution, or does it require a whole reset team to actually uh, reset the machine and uh, get everything ready for the next uh, ne next numerical or computational experiment? Uh, and, and following up from that, um, is there any plans to make it a user facility? Uh, so uh, our, our claim to fame is that we have done a programmable random quantum circuit mm -hmm. on the supremacy case, meaning that meaning that anything can be decomposed to it. But write any gate sequence you write. Mm -hmm. Any Hamiltonian we write, we can uh, we can write a gate sequence associated with right. it. But but given the coherence time we have, the result going to greatly disappoint you. But otherwise, we can just run it, write it, and run it. If that's what you're asking, if any gate sequence, we have a couple of gates. We have I swap. We have a square root of I swap. We have C Z. We have C phase. We have C naught, and any sequence you write in terms of these two qubit gates and single qubit gates, we can implement it this afternoon. And I see. But so the result it, is going to be disappointing. But it can be it, of co it, it can be implemented at the software level. I can just no no I can send it to a machine and send you the bit strings back tonight, but you would not yeah. learn yeah. much because of the decoherence. So our theory team spends lots of time to optimize these gate sequence and that's why we become very selective with the gate sequence and whatnot that's usually the challenge that's what i said heisenberg is more complicated if you could compose your question in terms of a spin dynamics for um 
for uh, um, uh, uh, for XY model, we should be in better shape because that's closer to the gates we can do and takes less gates. Thank you. I can maybe the, the sociology question of public facilities. There was an effort to create some uh, test beds uh, at national laboratories um, that is happening, but not super fast. Uh, but you can submit proposals for those. But there's also, you know, a few publicly available quantum computers. The problem is they're all small. So if you want a quantum computer that you could not emulate on your desktop, um, then you need to have friends at one of a few very successful companies. Uh, Google. Well, but but uh, you, you don't have to be friend. You just can. <laughs> uh, I, I receive proposals from uh, uh, professors very frequently, and uh, we consider them. There's no. But you know, is uh, we have tried to give access. It was not very successful, so we are going back to the uh, the, the system that you you write to one of us the way all these collaborators work, and then uh, we 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 think about it. If you could get us excited, you're you're done. Thank you. Yeah. There was Zilka has a question. Yeah, so so I, I was going to, to comment on uh, sort of the point that Rajiv tried to <laughs> raise and, and Joel started to comment on. So, so quantum materials for uh, new implementations of quantum computing. So I, I, I just proudly announced that we, we just got funded today uh, a, a so-called special research program in Austria and Germany, which aims at sort of working on the basis of that direction. So we are going to study the strongly correlated uh, systems, so like heavy fermions and also quantum spin liquids, if, if possible, and, and, and really study them with the tools, with qubits, for instance, with, with the tools that are sort of much closer to, to uh, quantum computation and just sort of see how we can bridge the two fields. So, so of course, there's many things behind that. I don't want to lay out all in detail, but, but there are definitely efforts. And I, I know that we are not the only ones working in this direction. So I think there is great interest also from our side to, to really bring innovation into that direction and uh, there are things going to happen. Great. And, and in terms of tunability, as you said, you want to control these things like in, in the heavy fermion systems, we also have topological materials. And because heavy fermions are so well tunable, right? You have very low energy scales and you can act on them with very small fields, for instance, that's really one thing that could be exploited. That you, for instance, uh, turn a system from being topological to non-topological. And then of course you will have to embed it all in, a, 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 in thin film technology and everything. That's all very challenging for these materials. But I mean, there are clear steps in this direction. What would be an example of a qubit there? Well, that, you, you, I, I guess we will still have to find it, but I mean, for instance, we could, of course, think of um, of of Majorana sort of kind of Majorana implementations and topological superconductors that are uh, might be possible in in uh, certain topological condo systems, for instance. So, so there are ideas, right? But everything this is very fundamental. What we are going to do, we're just trying to find these states and then sort of. Next, next, next directions would be to really make use of them. Good, thanks for the comment. Well, uh, maybe I should, I'm not seeing any other uh, urgent comments and I think I've uh, said enough for one day. Uh, let me hand it over to either my co-session chair or the organizers, because we're almost at lunchtime. Thanks for uh, listening to me and the uh, questions. It was it was great. I, I'm I'm very happy that I was giving this chance. Yeah, and let me second a note that is appearing in the chat, which is uh, thanks very much to Rajiv Piers and Brittany for their excellent organization of this week, and uh, let us all uh, applaud our organizing team. Thank you very much, and we we will endeavor to get the talks actually posted online to provide this uh, uh, provide a, a resource. For people to come back to, um, uh, it's inevitable that we only we're stuck in one time in California time zone, and so unless you've got heroes like Henri, who are able to stay up through the night, um, not everyone has had the chance to look at them. So, so uh, we'll we'll communicate with you all about uh, about um, uh, 
those postings. And whilst I have you, I just wanted to make a little push for uh, other institutions. It makes me wonder whether uh, both Google and uh, uh, Berkeley uh, would be interested in joining ICANN. We'd love to explore those possibilities in the future, because we think that this kind of interdisciplinary discussion, bringing together different groups is extremely important for pushing our fields ahead. But apart from that, anything else, Rajiv? No, I think uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and for Brittany to really putting in all the work, really. Yeah, let's have a round of applause to Brittany because uh, she really did a lot for us. Brittany, thank you so much. <laughs> the, only, the only great thing about online meetings is that the trip home is trivial. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so safe trip home, but I hope to see you all soon, <laughs> maybe in a few weeks time in person at uh, three dimensional or higher dimensional uh, meetings. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.